X-Men School, The Return of Rolf, The Introduction to Wolf, Trevor, Moe's, Dwight's Babysitter, Suspiciously No Aaron and Pete Plotline, and the unbridled rage I felt in the closing seconds of this episode. And I fell in love, so that stuff matters. No! Hey everybody, I'm Chris and I'm reviewing every episode of The Office ever, and today we are looking at Junior Salesman. Wallace is letting me hire a junior sales associate to sit at Jim's desk while he's away in Philly. You're going head to head against some real superstars, but you've got a really good chance. Clark has no chance. In this episode, there are a few good bits washed down by a current of poor pacing, all of which are beat senseless by overly jokey jokes, and then all run aground on quicksand. Do you need to be changed? Angry, sad, quicksand. Let's go! I understand nothing. I remember the bit of this episode was getting Clark to the junior salesman spots, but the details were all gone. I don't, I don't, I didn't remember this episode at all. So the moment that I realized that this was the episode in which all of the Dwight adjacent side characters were coming back for their cameo, you know, I was kind of excited to watch this one and do the analysis it, until I wasn't. Whoops. I ran to IMDb to see who wrote this one. And I'll be honest, I was a little disappointed to see that it was written by Carrie Kemper. And this marks such a stark tonal shift for her writing from episodes that I actually really dug the undercurrent of with the ultimatum spooked embalmed bodies rose from their sarcophagi for they were mummies no and the whale i'm so sorry Jim. but you know she's doing well in her career and power to her this episode sucks but it's okay she would go on and have a big part in Silicon Valley, which did have Chris Dianopolopolipsiblos in a reoccurring and fantastic role. A f car whose doors open like this. Not like this. Not like this. Okay, so let's pop this tart. We'll start with the cold opening off the heels of the fourth wall break with another foreshadowy fourth wall break cold opening. In this one, we get a spy cam via camera left recording on the ground for some reason while Pam and Brian talk off camera. Pam thanks him for the comfort he provided. And he's like, yo, no sweat. Thanks for being a good friend. Sure, anytime. It's all kind of innocuous, but I guess the important part here is that Pam's quick to bring up that Brian has a significant other and that shouldn't go unnoted. Say hi to Alyssa. Will do. And the punchline for the opening sequence is Meredith's now infamous line. Boom guy. Oh, hey Meredith. When are you gonna boom me? Dropping him from the credits in the break room, Clark is approaching Dwight for a crack at the junior salesman position that Wallace has given Dwight the authority to hire for. Not to beat this dead horse, but Wallace knows Andy is not at Scranton, which is not explicitly stated but you don't task non-people managers to hire employees when there is a direct line manager sitting in that branch. This conversation does kick off the Jim Pam drama for the episode though, both with needing to find a replacement for him at his desk to satisfy Pam, but also he wants to pitch to Wallace to invest in his company, which I'm gonna give you as much plot development as this story gets in the episode. There's a very exciting opportunity to be a core investor. Okay. Jim, I'm going to have to stop you right there. It doesn't work. And that's really just it. There's not a lot to this episode. Dwight is sorting through and interviewing old and new comrades and a mixture of bits and jokes and whatever. Like we find out that Dwight's super religious family actually dumped him into a skeezy boarding school for a couple of years. I spent several years at a private school where I was told I would be taught to harness my mutant abilities. It took me years to figure out that it was a con. The roster of interviewees is comprised of Rolf, who I believe we last saw in the season six company picnic. I heard him asking for a shoe that could increase his speed and not leave any tracks. Sensei Ira, who is way back from season two. That is Japanese for California roll. Actually, it's a symbol for eternal discipline. Ira, by the way, is wearing a necktie under his gi, so I thought that was a nice touch. 
Troy Underbridge makes an appearance, whom I don't think we've seen since season four. Do you have powers? Also from the fourth season is Dwight's former babysitter slash lover. I was his babysitter. And now you guys are dating? Purely carnal, that's all you need to know. We also see Trevor again from like three episodes ago, but it doesn't matter because he's amazing. Paintball. Oh, that sounds awesome. Can we wait till I get off work? And what are we supposed to do until then? Okay. Honestly, like a highlight of this episode for me. Uh, we're also introduced to Moe's brother, Zeke. Dwight's my cousin, so I ever heard him telling my brother Moe's about the job opportunity in the shower. Who's played by Matt Jones, which yes, if you're wondering, he is the voice of Wedge from the Final Fantasy Rebirth game. I, I guess among other things he's been in. <laughs> we're also introduced to a new friend of Dwight named Wolf, who's played by Will McCormick, who wrote Toy Story 4. Don't you mean Koi Story? So there's that. Try as he may, basically nothing's going his way. And Dwight doesn't want to disappoint his friends, so he has to go have Jim go and tell everybody that they're not getting the job, even though Jim would probably be pretty pissed about the stunt that Dwight just pulled with Wallace. Uh, I'd love to be in the loop, David. It's okay, go ahead, Jim. But Jim's focused in because he knows whoever's sitting at his desk after he leaves is going to be an important part of Pam's everyday life. And so he's in it to try to get Clark the job, which he does. Oh, hey, I'll take a coffee. Oh, I'm sorry. You got to be this cool for coffee. Pam is still a little shaken in this episode. Really, we don't know what happened between the fight and this episode. I like to think that they maybe casually made up or they did that thing that married couples do where they bicker and argue for a couple days and then like they just stay silent for a long time. And then at some point the silence is broken, but nothing's really resolved. They kind of move on like the conflict is fixed, but nothing, you know, really was ever spoken. So anyway, she's a little bit shaky in this episode, but after Jim takes off to Philly, Pam offers to Dwight to like form an alliance, which is a great callback to season one, to prank Clark. Wanna haze the new guy? Who, me? Us. Which then Dwight kind of demonstrates why he was in the Scranton Strangler video. The episode closes with a voiceover from Jim as we get B-roll projecting a double meaning here. Because of where my desk was, I spent all those years looking at Pam. And I fell in love, so that stuff matters. Definitely does. But with that, let's dive into the deeper meaning. What does a bean mean? Someone please explain it to Kat. This is probably gonna be short. Must be this cool to ride. The Junior Salesman episode seems to be exploring a few different concepts, but they're all pretty surface and similar. First, let me just state that they almost effortlessly shifted Dwight very casually into the manager type role without really making much fanfare about it, with the majority of his on-screen time being spent in the manager's office, leading interviews and talking heads from Michael's old desk. Really, he's kind of come into his own in this position. I think it's foreshadowing, making us a little bit more comfortable with the resolution of Dwight's looming story in the next, what, 10 episodes. If this was on purpose, it was a genius way of getting us comfortable with Dwight in the boss's seat, assuming that it was on purpose, which may be giving season nine writers more credit than they deserve. That felt mean. You know I wouldn't hire any of these all-stars. Look, a lot of these people were probably doing the best that they could against a network desperate for results. Greg Daniels resolute on shitting all over the jam relationship. And then, you know, a few casting issues that they experienced. <laughs> it's a rough season for everybody, I think. Do you have any idea what I had to do to get that sale from Jan? But beyond getting us comfortable with Dwight in the manager's office, the episode really seems to be implying a subtle theme of uh, be careful what you wish for. Be careful what you wish for. This is based on evidence from the plot, suggesting things like Dwight wanted to replace Jim as a friend and as a coworker and a desk mate only to find out that his friends, his personal network, is not a good fit for a replacement to Jim. Jim wanted to go chase his dream job, but is now seeing the ramifications it's having on his wife personally and professionally. Pam wanted Philly Jim to be happy and to make this whole thing work. But now she's having to deal with the reality that the separation is causing. 
And I would assume that any plotline involving Aaron searching for her birth parents, which I don't think I mentioned at this point, they cut a lot of this episode that uh, seemed to follow Aaron searching for her birth parents. I don't think I mentioned that. I might have cut that out of the script. But that's a thing that was going to happen in this episode and did not happen. And I would assume it would have injected some drama and maybe some shenanigans, maybe some more depth to this episode beyond just Dwight interviewing people and then not hiring any of them. Anyway, I would assume that any plotline involving Aaron searching for her birth parents was certainly going to yield some awkward results and further this idea of, you know, some threads are better left well enough alone. But all of this culminates to Jim's lines, which I'm probably going to have to read for you because I'm not sure YouTube's going to let me show a clip that long. No, it does matter who ends up sitting next to Pam when I'm gone. The people around you are basically who you end up spending your entire life with. I mean, because of where my desk was, I spent all of those years looking for Pam, then I fell in love. So this stuff matters. It definitely does. Reducing all the pro and proper nouns from that whole thing, we're left with people we surround ourselves with are who we spend our life with. They are who will influence us. They are who we will influence. And with that proximity comes the opportunity for closeness and more. But the devious choice to demonstrate that Brian has just straight up fallen for Pam during Jim's monologue is dastardly because it's applying the same logic that Jim just said about Brian. That he's been following Pam around for years, just off screen, following their lives and secretly in love with Pam. That's creepy. That's a weird thing to show. We're breaking the fourth wall for the first real time in the series. And it's creepy. <laughs> Maybe it's commentary on the Internet hive mind following the show. I, I don't I that's too much credit. And so against the backdrop of this episode, Jim is facing the effects of his choice and perhaps that he's losing Pam to another man in the process because that man is just right there. And I hate all of this. But yeah, the show seems to be subtly acknowledging that Pam is susceptible to forming relationships with nearby men who treat her well, like she's just animalistically drawn to empathetic men or in like literary terms she has no agency in this story she's just a thing who has an mo and she will follow those rules oh here's my husband my significant other is not giving me the attention that i want so i'm gonna go with this guy she's just a thing with rules on how they operate and you know it's kind of on point because I read one of the writers say that Greg Daniels and the majority of the writer's room didn't think that the audience would buy that a guy as studly as Boom Mike Bryan would fall in love with Pam. I'm in full support of women and their ongoing bravery in speaking out. I'm no savior for women. I get criticized for that Pam hate video all the time. I am married, super in love with my wife. <laughs> she doesn't even watch this. This is an example of the dark side of male dominated writing, like writing room, writing for women because she has no agency here. It's just implied the danger is she's just going to fawn over this guy because Jim's not around. And this guy is. She can't help it. That's bad. <laughs> this is bad. And also, Pam's a Scranton 10, man. She'd probably be a six in New York, but she's like a seven here in Scranton. This guy is like, I don't know. I mean, he's cut. Like, he's pretty physically fit. But guys with muscles are all over Scranton. Just ask Oscar. Bulk or definition? Definition. Bruce Kenwood. He hangs out at Planet Fitness. But yeah, that's the message of the episode. Surround yourself with good people who are good for you for good reasons. And seems like basic advice that any financial alpha bro on TikTok would give you. So let's rate this thing. This is the worst. Okay, the cold opening is 
the worst. It shouldn't exist. It's not funny. It's not even really dramatic. It's uncomfortable. It's quiet. And that's really everything the opposite of what makes for a good cold opening of a sitcom is happening in this. Meredith's line is pretty great. Honestly, I love it. Boom guy. When are you going to boom me? Uh, it's probably one of my most quoted Meredith lines. It would be excellent if it were in the middle of a killing field where multiple characters are just saying lots of things. This doesn't really work as a punchline to a cold opening. Also, there's like another 15 seconds of just lingering silence. It's a one out of five for me, but maybe also my vote for the worst cold opening of the series. This is such bull crap. Well, okay, so while I trust that they removed the Aaron plotline for reasons that are reasonable, I suspect that it was actually just to make more use of the cameo village that they created with the Dwight bit. Her plotline might have been a mess, though. I, you never really know what you're going to get with Aaron-led things. Oh, yeah. But it at least seems like it would have propelled a fresh storyline together. And then also knowing that it was planned, written, shot, and then dropped on the cutting room floor makes them picking up this plotline in the future just a little frustrating because I remember thinking, oh yeah, I guess she is an orphan. I feel like we haven't talked about that for a while. Weird that they would just bring it up in the finale. But the X-Men joke. This is the one that broke me for this episode. This is when I knew, okay, we're we're in we're in danger zone right now. This bit maybe works fine for a show like Community or My Name is Earl. My name is Earl. What was that? I don't know. Apparently I made some sort of reference. With like some side character like Starburns, who's not a main character with richly established lore. It's just some side character that can just say some zany thing and then you're like, huh, that's weird. Do we get our resumes back or do you keep them? I have a chili recipe on the back that I really want to keep. And while this joke plays into the what does Dwight view reality as kind of thing that spanned the whole series, it's weird to think that this rural Pennsylvania Dutch traditional family, which is an upbringing that makes Dwight so unique and different as a character, was actually just shipped off to a fake boarding school for a couple years. Like, why would they inject this bit of zaniness into his backstory is beyond me. Like, maybe they were going to play with this as some sort of concept in the spinoff series that was doomed from the farm on. Or maybe it was a Rain Wilson deep reference to that superhero movie he was in that I didn't like. <laughs> I don't know. I like this bit even less. I was actually watching this episode, ready to give it a three out of five, like a low three out of five, just thinking a lot of these jokes aren't landing, but a few are. And Trevor, like I said, always welcome on my screen. Do you see yourself as a team player or a self-starter? No, no, and no. There were only two options. Checkmate. We got far too little Trevor. So's Moe's, he's fantastic. Some of these bits are decent in their own way, but then nothing prepared me for the camera to turn here. Stop creeping on your film subjects, dude. She's married and you're with somebody. She is the subject in your documentary. You have to have some ethics, my dude. Further, why would they camera turn to focus on Brian? I guess the creators at this point of the documentary, the PBS documentary were like, you know, what's a great aspect for our documentary about people who work in the American workplace is we should follow them around for seven or eight, nine years. And then we should, at the very end of it, demonstrate how when you as a documentarian inject yourself into people's lives, it all gets messy and then at the end, we can start showing how like there's these relationships. It's stupid. This is all stupid and it doesn't make sense in the universe that they have created lovingly and meticulously created for the show. All that's out the door. The implication that there's danger of Pam and Brian hooking up at some point because Jim and Pam did something kind of similar uh, years and years and years ago is 
kind of a hurdle too high for me to jump over. But still, for Chris Gethard's sake... Don't pronounce it phonetically, which is get hard. I'm going to give this a two out of five. That was a joke. I'm not going to do that. This is a one out of five episode, for sure. My day shot. But I actually think it's better than the previous episode because there's no dramatic fight. I've been really ranty the last several episodes. I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing. Leave it in the comments. Don't forget to join me on Twitch. I'm doing streams uh, on Wednesday nights for sure, but every other time that I have open time, which is not often, I'm busy. So follow me over there. And I just want to take a moment to thank the fine folks who are supporting my channel on Patreon and YouTube memberships. And that list includes our Dundee's host, Amber Piercy, Anna, Dark Lasagna, and Yeesher. And our inner circle members is Avery, Heidi and the Yuna, Jack Yestis, and Mooch. And to the rest of these fine folks, thank you so much for contributing. If you want to support the channel, you could find the links in the description of this video. If you're not ready to get there yet, you could just like this video and subscribe to my channel. Got lots planned. We have 10 more episodes of The Office, I believe. Could be wrong there. And I have a lot more planned for what's coming up after The Office. So stay tuned for some announcements there over the next, I guess, couple of months. We're moving quickly. Thanks for watching and we'll see you next time.